Hey gang, welcome back to Let's Level Up. My name is Rick Perez, and in this video series, we're going to be talking about Keyforge and how to take your play experience from novice to the pro level. Now, I say pro level kind of in jest because the game's still very new. I think I'm pretty good at it, but I don't know how good I am because there's not a whole lot of competition around San Angelo. So uh, if you guys are online and want to play or have questions or comments or videos you'd like to see in this series in the future, please hit me up on Twitter at Let's Level Up or on Facebook on our uh, official Facebook page, letslevelup.net. That's D-O-T-N-E-T, -E -T, same as this YouTube channel. Um, now, what is Keyforge? Right? We're this video is going to be for, meant for novice players who may not, have, uh, may not know anything about the game. Keyforge is a unique deck game made by the creator of Magic the Gathering, Richard Garfield, and published by Fantasy Flight Games. Now, unique deck game is something that is brand new to me, and I think to the world. Now, when you buy into Keyforge, you spend $10 and you buy a 36-card deck. Now, that deck itself is going to have a particular Archon and three symbols on it when you look at it. The Feathered Belderoth of the Grounds. And they have three houses. Every Archon or every deck is going to be co composed of three of the seven houses in Keyforge. Now, again, this is Series 1, so if you're watching this in the future, likely there have been new houses introduced uh, to the game. The houses that are involved in this deck are Untamed, Dis, and, and uh, Sanctum. Uh, there are also Shadows, Mars, Brobnar, and a missing one. Let's see. Untamed, Dis, Sanctum, Shadows, Brobnar, Mars, and Logos is the, four, is the seventh one I'm missing. And they all kind of have their own flair to the game. They all kind of have their own little things that they do. But each of these houses is going to bring 12 cards to our 36 card deck. So each of our, our decks are basically going to be split into perfect thirds between these houses. Everything about this game is, is procedurally generated. So there are a billion plus combinations of decks out there. And the whole idea is that there are no two decks that will have these same cards. Um, with that in mind, there is no pre-con to this game. There's no deck creating. Uh, you buy the deck outright for $10 and that's the one you play until you want to get another deck. You can't trade cards between each other. Um, now, to me, that is a really awesome thing. But I know there are going to be people who really love deck crafting and theory crafting and things like that. Um, it, this Keyforge is not going to scratch that itch for you. Keep playing Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh or Pokemon or whatever other card games that do that now. That's going to be that style. This is not that kind of game. And uh, it's awesome for that because this is a really awesome way to just spend 10 bucks, 15 bucks to enter a sealed tournament, you get your whole deck right there and you play it and you have an amazing time. It's really fun. The actual purpose of this game is to unlock the secrets of a hidden vault on the Crucible, which is the planet that we're on. And when to do that, we have to forge three keys, which are these discs here. Now, when you forge a key, you just flip it over and then you'll know based on how many keys you have flipped when you're gonna win the game. The first player to forge three keys wins the game. Now you're going to do that by spending a currency known as Amber. Each time you forge a key by default, it costs six Amber, and you'll do that during the forge a key step of your turn. Now you'll be getting Amber through a means, uh, through uh, many different means on your turn throughout play. Uh, typically through creature combat, playing cards, or even a thing called reaping, which is a specific action. Um, but there are a number of different ways to do that, and we'll talk about that in this video. Uh, Amber, whenever you get it, you're going to collect it from a common supply area and you're going to put it onto your Archon. That's going to be your pool of Amber. Now that doesn't mean necessarily it's going to be the only way to get Amber because you can do things like steal Amber from your opponents or take Amber if that one of your creatures may have captured and put it onto your own if you have a character that lets you do that. Um, there's a lot of really cool things that go into this very simple premise. I can't kill my opponent outright in this game. I can't deck my opponent outright. I've only got 36 cards, and chances are I'm going to run through that deck and I'm going to have to shuffle my discard pile and make a new deck um, during the play somehow. But the first player, again, to craft three different keys, excuse me, forge different keys, is going to be the winner. Now, right now, there are three colors of keys. There's no rules in play that are going to that affect that at this time, but there are theories that the colors of keys uh, can be... Uh, will matter in later sets, i.e. there may be a cost to uh, reduce the cost of a blue key or increase the cost of a red key or force you to forge certain keys at certain times or prevent 
people from forging certain colored keys at certain times. So, uh, but yeah, right now we have red, yellow, and, and excuse me, red, yellow, and blue, and they really are just colors right now. They don't do anything in the game yet. Now this is a living card game, and the idea that the rule set is very alive right now. We've actually already had since release one update to the rule booklet. You can't get the rule booklet anywhere else online, so look at the description of this video and get a, an exact link to that. Read through it. It's an easy read, and there are a lot of cool things in there, but that's really going to help you um, know how the game is played. Now I'm going to walk you through each step of excuse me each step of a player's turn and talk about the different card types. Now Key Forge is prom uh, prominently one versus one, uh, although there are some multiplayer variants that we've been talking about on the uh, Key Forge Facebook community. Um, but there, yeah, but right now it's just one on one officially. All tournament play and organized play will be one versus one, either in a sealed uh, uh, or an Archon mode. Archon is basically a, you bring your own deck, sealed, you open the box and you play with whatever you're given. Uh, so to determine a first player, do that by rolling a die, flipping a coin, however you want to do that, rock, paper, scissors, yada, yada. Um, we're going to say that I'm going to go first and my opponent's going to go second. So in this game, the first player draws seven cards. And it's a unique first player, first turn rule. When you play the first time in a game, you can only play one card from your hand. Um, so if you're the first player, when you take your first turn, you can only play one card. Now, let's take a look at the different types of cards and see what comprises our deck. The first kind of card we're going to talk about are creatures. Now, you'll notice the anatomy of each card is a little different depending on the type of the card. There are currently four kinds of cards in each deck. There are creatures, actions, artifacts, and upgrades. Now, each card is going to have the house it belongs to in the top left corner. So you can see that this is from House Sanctum. The name of the creature is Sequus. It is a creature type, and it has the subtype of Human and Knight. Um, it also has unique text here uh, with the bold word Reap. We'll talk more about actions and play abilities and effects uh, later when we talk about playing creatures. Uh, each creature has a power, which is the amount of damage it deals to another creature and also the amount of hit points that it has. And then it also can have an armor rating. Armor is used to absorb damage the first time it takes damage each turn. So in this case, my creature Sequus has four power and two armor, which means if it were to get attacked by a creature who has five total power, it would absorb two of the power and then take three damage tokens on it. And then that would be how much, it basically would have one health left for the remainder of its life until I remove that damage. Now, when a creature takes damage, it doesn't reduce the amount of power that it deals. So even though my Sequus has three damage currently on it, I still deal four power, or excuse me, four damage worth of power when I attack another creature. That was something that kind of confused me early on in the game, but damage does not remove the amount of power a creature has. The creature is removed from play when its damage is equal to or, or over the amount of power that it has. The next type of card we have are actions. Now you can see that this is from House Untamed and it also has a symbol here we haven't talked about yet. Anytime you play a card with that symbol, you immediately take one amber from the common supply and add it to your personal pool. So you get that without even having to worry about the card's effects. Now this is an action, actions are played and then immediately discarded or sometimes will affect what happens the rest of your turn um, or even can affect your opponent's next turn. Um, this play effect says return a creature from your discard pile to your hand. Now regrowth allows me to basically take a creature out of my uh, discard pile or graveyard for you Magic the Gathering players and then bring it back to my hand. If it's of the house type that I'm playing this turn, I can immediately play that creature. Uh, if not, I can store it for another turn. Uh, actions are basically a one shot. You play it, then you discard it, and then it's going to go to your discard. The next type of card we're talking about here are going to be artifacts. Now artifacts are a little tricky because it's hard to see them, but you'll notice that the name of the artifact is going to be at the top of the card, not in the middle of the card like the other cards, and it'll say artifact right underneath the name of the card. Now in this case we have Mighty Javelin, which is a House Brobnar card. Notice I get the amber just for playing it, and this has this is a weapon. So when artifacts come into play, they're going to go into play underneath your battle line, which are where your creatures are played to, uh, and they're going to come into play exhausted. All creatures, when they're put into play, come into play exhausted as well, unless they have a playability that says otherwise. 
Now this has a special ability called Omni. Now Omni allows me to play this even if I don't declare, in this case, House Brobnar or whatever the name of the house of the, uh, uh, is. I can play this basically anytime I, I, uh, I'm on my play step, assuming it's ready. And this lets me sacrifice Mighty Javelin to deal four damage to a creature. Now sacrifice means that it's going to remove from the game. Unless a, uh, an, an artifact tells you to sacrifice it or a player removes it from the board, you're going to be able to use it anytime you declare its house type. Finally, the last type of card that we have here are upgrades. Now, upgrades like artifacts, you're going to have the name of the card at the top of the card rather than in the middle. Uh, you'll notice that the block of text is at the top rather than at the bottom, so to show a little distinction there in the types of cards. Uh, this one also gives me an amber when I play. It is of House Untamed, and the Way of the Wolf is the name of it. Now, upgrades are unique because they are the only card that requires you to have a, a targetable um, a creature to attach it to. Now it could be your creatures, it could be your opponent's creatures, but you can't play an upgrade unless there's a creature in play. It's the only card type that you can't just play to play to collect the amber. Uh, you have to have the creature there. Now this says the creature grants uh, gains skirmish, and that basically means when you fight or use this creature to fight, it is dealt no damage in return. So really cool little upgrade there to make a strong creature even stronger. So we're going to walk through a couple sample turns now that we know the cards that make up our deck and then show you how the game is played. Now, if you went to the pre-release, you may have gotten one of these awesome little cards here. This is a way to basically, um, or basically a player A that allows us to step through each turn. So we're going to use this while we're going through and teaching the game here. So step one is a very easy step, but it's one that you can actually forget. It's called Forge a Key. Now this by default, is the only way that you can actually forge keys during your turn. And remember, we have to forge three keys in order to win the game. So, if we have six amber, assuming that's how much the key currently costs, because again, card effects can lower or raise the amount of amber it takes to forge a key, uh, then we can go ahead and forge a key. In this case, right now we only have three amber. Actually, we have zero amber since our first turn. Um, so we can't. If we had six, we would use that, basically remove six amber from our Archon here, bring it back to the general supply, flip over a key, and let our opponents know that we have a key forge. So that's step one of our phase, forging a key. Very easy. Again, if we have six amber, we spin that to forge a key. Step two is we're going to choose a house. Now there are certain cards that come into play that actually manipulate this step and either force us or remove our options from when we can house choo uh, choosing a house. But by default, we're gonna choose one of the three houses that are on our Archon or basically within our deck. This is a really, really important step to this game. And it's easy for players to get, um, uh, to make bad decisions here because they have more than a certain type of card in their hand. Now, we're gonna talk about that a bit more during step three because it is important. Um, so the houses that I can choose here are Untamed, Dis and Sanctum, uh, because those are the houses that are in my deck. So on this turn, I'm going to go ahead and choose House Sanctum. Now I say it aloud so my opponent knows that I've picked that house. It's just an etiquette thing there. Then I'm going to go ahead and play House my, my, my first card here, Bulwark. Now when I play a creature, it goes into my battle line and it's going to come in exhausted. It may look like it's tapped, that's because it is, but again, you know, tapped, whatever. Um, so now it's exhausted. At the, there is going to be a step where I ready my creatures. Now, one thing that uh, that confused me early in this game is that in Magic, you untap, you know, and then you go into your upkeep and then you go into your draw step. Well, in Keyforge, the ready phase and the draw phase are at the end of your turn, not your beginning. So if you have a creature or something that you can do to your opponents that it causes them to exhaust, they're basically going to be without that creature unless they can somehow ready it during their turn. Because remember, you don't ready your creatures until the end of your turn. So step three is what we just did. And again, on our first turn for the first player, they only get to play one card from their hand. Now, when you go to your subsequent turns or whenever the second player starts their phase, they can play as many cards from their hand that match the house that we declared on step two. It's a big thing there. It's not just playing the cards from our hand either. It's activating the creatures that we have on the board or using our artifacts. It also allows us to discard cards of that house during that step. But everything that we do during step three 
is determined by what's on the board right now, what's in our hand, and typically based on the house that we declared in step two. Again, step two is very important because it, it changes the decisions that we can make and alters the way that we play the game during step three. And step three is basically the meat of the game. It's where you're gonna spend all of your time. Now, I played Bulwark there. Um, that's my step three. We're gonna go into this more in step two since, again, first player, first turn, it's a little weird. Um, so that's my step three. Step four is ready cards. Any cards that you have exhausted, you ready them by basically untapping them. You turn them right side up. Then we're going to draw cards. We're going to draw up to six cards that we have in our hand. We drew seven to start with and we only got to play one, so we have six now. So we're, again, basically we're gonna skip this step. Then it would go into our player's turn and they would go through the same five steps. First they'd forge a key, then they would declare a house, then they'd play any cards, and then we would play, uh, then they were ready, and then they would draw. All right, my turn two. This is my board, basically. I've got one bull copy of Bulwark on my battle line. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and declare House Sanctum. Again, I don't have enough amber here to forge a key, so I don't really do anything during that step. Um, I, I declare House Sanctum again. I've got one Sanctum card here, um, and I wanna show you what creatures can do once they're put onto the battlefield, because this is a big deal as well. So I'm going to go ahead and play Champion Anathel. Now Champion Anathel has Taunt, uh, which is a, an important thing. Now when you play a creature to your battle line, you play it on either the left or the right flank. You can't ever put it in between two creatures. Uh, so in this case, Champion Anathel, I'm going to play it on the left flank of Bulwark. Now Bulwark's special ability is a persistent effect. It says each of Bulwark's neighbors get plus two armor. Champion Anathel is Taunt, which means its neighbors can't be attacked directly. So in essence, Champion Anathel right now is a six uh, power, three armor creature. Having three armor is huge in this game. Um, but right now he comes into play uh, exhausted, right? And then we have one creature that we can do something with in Bulwark. So I did a little manipulation here so that way we can see combat in action. Now, when I want to use a ready creature, there are three things I can do with that creature. The first and probably most important thing I can do with a creature is reap. Now to reap with a creature, you exhaust them and you're basically gonna exhaust them anytime you use them. Uh, but to reap, you exhaust and then you take one amber from the supply and add it to your pool. You can do that with any creature that you have readied of the house that you declared that turn. So next turn, I could actually reap with both of, both of my creatures and get uh, two more amber. So one here and then one there. When you use a creature, you're gonna use them one at a time and fully resolve the effects before you move on to the next. Uh, certain creatures will have a reap effect here that will get triggered anytime you do a reap action with that creature. Um, that's reap. The second thing we can do with a creature is fight with the creature. Now fight is when I exhaust the creature and then pick one of my opponent's creature to deal combat damage to. Now when I fight a creature, we deal damage to each other at the same time unless card effects say, other, card effects say otherwise. So in this case, my bulwark is gonna deal four damage to the dust imp and it's going to deal two damage to Bulwark, but since I have two armor on Bulwark, this basically gets absorbed and doesn't actually add to my creature. Now, Dust Imp only has two power, so this means this Dust Imp creature is going to be destroyed uh, from the fight. Now, when Dust Imp gets destroyed, its controller takes two amber from the supply and adds it to there. So I kind of did him a favor right there, uh, but Dust Imp is off the board now. The third thing that we can do with a card is use its action. Now, an action will be printed down here. It'll say action, and it'll have text there that you would resolve when you do that. So again, to use an action of a card, you exhaust it, and then you use its action. So that's our step three. Uh, let's say we went ahead and just reaped for our official step. And then step four, we're going to ready our cards. Remember, Champion NFL has Taunt, so we're gonna leave that just slightly above the other card. Uh, and uh, we're gonna go and draw back cards. So I have five cards in hand. I'm gonna draw one. And that's it, that's how you play Keyforge. This game is very, very easy to learn. My nine-year-old and I have been playing this quite a bit, uh, and there's even decks that he's super, super competitive with against me, and it kicked my butt three keys to zero on more than one occasion. Um, again, 
what we're trying to do here is a mass amber, but that's easier said than done because there are plenty of cards that manipulate the amount of amber you have or cause your opponent to ramp up quickly. Board presence is a big thing, and in the future video series here, we're going to be talking about different tips and tricks that are going to help you learn this game and actually learn masterful tactics to, to conquer any would-be Archon that you would step against. Hope you guys liked this video. If you did, please drop us a thumbs up. Subscribe to this channel here for more awesome Keyforge content. And uh, until next time, thank you and game on.